Okay. And then uh, um, any any other committees, please? Yeah. yeah. We want to call the school committee meeting to order uh, February 26th. <coughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, this kicks off the. Hi, Ann. The. Um, three weeks so three nights of uh, finance committee review of the budgets um, so uh, as everybody in this room knows and just for those who are might be watching on on TV um, what we have now is the suit the uh, tonight we're going to review the, the school committee budget um, so um, and then next week in the week following we have the the budget as submitted by the town manager so I forget the exact breakdown for the next two weeks it's several departments next week and then the following week the remaining and I think capital also the, the, the following week yeah. yes and enterprise on the 13th so we're here for the next uh, next three weeks next two weeks and uh, three total including tonight uh, so that's our agenda item for tonight um, is the school committee budget um, would like to thank the members of the finance committee who, who submitted questions ahead of time so we could send to uh, to John and Gail and everybody so they could they could compile the answers uh, would also like to thank the members of the finance committee who found the time to attend many of these meetings in the past several weeks I think it's helpful to, to as this process moves along and um, Hi, Karen. Would like to thank also uh, uh, John and Gail for their work and, and, and whoever else I know that, that worked on this and, and putting together answers to these questions. Um, as I read through them, their they're thorough, detailed answers is great. I'm sure we'll get into it tonight in, in, in more discussion. Uh, but thank you for the time already that you spent doing this. So, um, anything else from anybody on the finance committee before we turn it over to, uh, to John and Gail and everybody else? No, I agree. It looked like a lot of time right. was put into the answers. Thank you. Okay. So, um, Dr. R, do you have any? Did you want to make any opening comment? Or I mean, we, we weren't doing the presentation because you guys yep. got through the presentations mm -hmm. with us. Many of you, either in person or perhaps watch them at home, but appreciate that was a change of income process last year or the year before, and um, we appreciate that. So, you know, we're not making a presentation, um, which is really. Already has anything to say? Yeah, I just I just want to echo what you just said, and it really was a team effort to to put all this together. Gail was the the point person, and Sharon Ejiosi e. with the special ed questions did an amazing job. Um, so what I want to do is I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to Gail, um, and she will walk you through the the parts you know the themes of the uh, of the questions. But I do want to say that thank you for those who attended or listened to the various meetings that we've had. Um, I think the January budget meetings went very well for us. I believe that everyone received copies originally of the superintendent's budget, which has now officially become the school committee's budget, which we did provide a revised copy of that, which does include the introductory comments um, from the chair. There were no number changes. The budget that was presented was the budget that was ultimately approved. We did add a couple of charts that people had asked us to add, and we made a few changes based upon some comments we received, but the content stayed the same. So if you had already gone through the school committee's budget, uh, the superintendent's budget, there were no significant changes to that. Um, we have sent the answers to the questions that were submitted from the committee. Thank you for taking the time to do that. It does help us prepare for the meeting to have some of those ahead of time. We also did provide, as part of our school committee process, we also received questions from the committee, so we were very happy to answer the hundred some odd questions that we received from the committee. So I believe you also received those. The approach we took this year was slightly different. We're, historically, we may have organized them by the person who submitted the question, but this year we organized them more by theme so that we could really tell where the questions were focused on so that we could make sure our answers and any subsequent presentations were directed in that manner. Um, we didn't necessarily take that approach with the Finance Committee. They seemed to be grouped that way when we received them, um, so we did appreciate that, and it, it's helpful to do that. With me tonight, um, I just want to make sure everyone sort of knows everyone. Obviously, everyone knows 
Dr. Doherty. Um, Chris Kelly, who is Assistant Superintendent, joined us this year. Myself, we have Sharon Stewart, who is the Interim Director of Student Services, who has been a phenomenal addition to the group, and I can't thank both of them enough for all of their help in answering the questions. Um, okay, shoot me, but we also have, in case there were any questions from the facility side, um, Joe was kind enough to join us this evening. So just so you get a sense of who is in the room, we just wanted to make sure we had the right people to address any additional questions. If there are questions that we don't have answers readily at hand, we will be more than happy to provide answers to you um, after the meeting. As Elaine mentioned, we did not prepare a formal presentation. We thought it would be better to just sort of see if there were any follow-up questions to what you presented. We can sort of walk through high level our approach to them. The other item that was in the information that we provided, we did see that there were some questions on the capital plan and where we are with some of the projects. We did include a memo that was presented to school committee on February 7th, which was a very detailed update as to where each of the three significant capital projects are. The same information, the approach we're taking because these projects all cross multiple lines. We're We've taken the approach that we're trying to make frequent updates to all the committees pretty much at the same time. So we worked very closely with the town manager on these updates. So we prepared these, presented it to school committee. Bob, I believe last night, had a similar packet in the select board information, which was the same. Um, and I think a lot of the same wording and information that's in here will also be in the town meeting warrant when you guys get to that. Um, so that pretty much goes into as much information as we have right now with where we stand on the various capital projects. Our next slated update right now is tentatively scheduled for March 28th. It will be our next update to the school committee. So our approach is as we get closer and we make sure that those are the dates, we will be inviting <coughs> other select the select board as well as members of the finance committee if they would like to come and attend those meetings we feel that that would be the best approach is to invite other boards to the school committee update so that everyone can hear the information at the same time um, and at that point I believe Bob is planning on attending John and I will be presenting um, and Joe will be <coughs> attending as well so that's the next scheduled update where we feel we'll have some additional information so I know that the I think it's the 13th is when the capital will be discussed as part of this project. But we did want to let folks know that we included that memo and any of the questions that were raised to us, we have basic, I will say we copied and pasted, but we provided to school committee as our answers to the finance committee because that was the most up-to-date information that we have. Um, so I'm not sure if there are specific areas based on the questions that were raised that people wanted to dive a little bit deeper into. I know as we went through the process, we did provide an update in the overall budget overview and presentations on where we are <coughs> with the override, where we stood with hiring positions, spend. Um, we have received some questions in here as to where we are, what we presented during the budget is really the latest information. What we are cautioning people is some of them were any of the positions we have said we've hired. We still have the 1.8 position at the high school that we're still actively recruiting on. That's the only override position that still remains open. A lot of the other expenses, we're only halfway through the year, so we haven't spent it all, so I can't report out on where exactly we are on the technology or other items because, again, we're still relatively early on in the school year. And for us, we always like to remind folks that our year really starts in September, albeit the budget starts in July. Ours really starts in the September time frame. Um, the other area that we spent a lot of time on which is why I have Sharon sitting so close to me, is throughout the budget process is the special education. We really spent a lot of time educating and walking people through the special education budget, why it is so tricky, why it's very difficult to predict 18 months into the future exactly what our special education costs are going to be given the dynamic nature of that. So we did spend a lot of time and we 
being chair and spent a lot of time trying to be very thoughtful on how we have answered the questions. We do also caution people that there is only so much information we can provide. We cannot get into specifics on items and there are areas where we just cannot give much more information because we never want to be in a position where we have identified a specific student in a program associated with a cost. So it's not that we're intentionally not answering questions, but we are intentionally not answering questions because we can only go so far in answering them if that makes sense to folks. And I do also want to acknowledge, I know Bob's not here, but we've worked very closely with the town manager, with the chair and vice chair of the finance committee throughout this whole process. And we appreciate the time that they have spent as well as I know Bob will be presenting it as part of his budget, but the ability of the town to reallocate within accommodated costs to alleviate some of the pressure we are feeling this year um, as well into next year related to the special ed out of district costs. And sort of along those lines, and a lot of it was highlighted during the school committee meetings, but you sort of summarize some of the things that you're going to be looking to do from a special ed perspective to try and bring some of these future costs in. I know you guys did talk about some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, when we talk about the themes of the questions, certainly through the school committee the budget process and through the finance committee, many of them were centered around special education and just trying to understand why is this so difficult to accurately predict and contain. So I'd say it's around prediction and containment seem to be the themes there. And the prediction of it is related to each individual child. So we have anywhere from seven to 750 students who require specialized education in Reading. Um, and the reason the numbers vary is that some kids can enter during the year, some kids can exit during the year for different reasons. So it's whatever the point in time is that we count, the head count might be different. And every child requires something slightly different. We, of course, look for common needs, common profiles, so that we're able to group children, educate them in small groups where appropriate. Um, but by its very nature, it is very staff intensive. So when we talk about general education planning, we look at class size, how many children are in a class, how many teachers are needed, how many specialists, and all that. It's a little more predictable and controllable. Um, and it isn't special ed because one child differs from the next. Um, so that's what makes it difficult from the prediction standpoint. And the other factor that layers into that is we begin the budget process in, in all towns. You know, I've worked in a, in a few. Um, my last position, I worked for three towns concurrently, so I was always doing three budgets at the same time and, you know, updating and monitoring and all that. So um, you're, you're constantly looking at it, but you begin that process in the fall. Um, and as Gail said, not, not 25 minutes ago, we really begin our year in September for the most part. So we're beginning to project what will we need by June of 2020 in November of 2018. So we have to have some understanding of, well, who are those children? There'll be children who will be entering our system either because they moved in, well, there's no way to predict that, or they might be coming into our system because they've turned three years old and have intensive needs. Some of those kids we know about when they're only two years old because of our relationships with the early intervention programs. Some we don't, so they're surprises. Um, and then we have children who, as they go through their developmental stages of growth, their needs become more intense and or more apparent. So the way that a child looks in sixth grade is different than how they're gonna look in ninth or 10th grade. So we have to make those adjustments. And although we're using research to inform our decisions, experienced people to inform the teams about what we should be doing for children, there are gonna be variables that arise for which no one predicted, no one understood would become that important. So we have to adjust. Um, so those are some of the variables that come into play for the prediction factor. The other around the containment factor yeah, that's what I was <laughs> is um, because it's a staff intensive model, the containment of costs become a bit challenging, whether we're talking about our in-district 
or the out of district. And in district, it can play out in who are the people in our buildings working with these children? What kind of people do we need? Do we need teachers? Do we need more behavior analysts? Do we need more paraprofessionals, speech and language? And that all plays out based on the individual team decisions that um, detail what services and supports any individual child needs. And I think that with this particular year, so just for example, as the school committee put forth um, and the school department put forth their best budget last year, had tremendous support from the community to keep resources right here in the district. Um, between the time that was all settled in the spring and when school opened in September, I know of at least eight children whose placements changed. And, we're, and, and that's, those are all out of district placements. So that was not because of um, lack of proper planning or inexperienced people who didn't understand what to do. It, those were not the variables. It was just the nature of who those children were and what came um, to become apparent variables that had to be addressed immediately. And eight was kind of a lot. That, I think, was unusual. Um, it, Probably in a district this size, you're going to have three or four every year that between the close of school and the opening of school, there's going to be significant change needed. Um, to have eight, that I think played out in needing to hire some staff at the beginning of the school year um, and um, either zero out or dramatically decrease what had been funded in particular other line items within special ed. Mm -hmm. So that it then constricted our ability to do some things within those line items this year. So there is that sort of domino going forward effect. Um, so how do you contain that? You, you need to have good programs. I mean, it's seems like an oversimplified answer, but that really is what it comes down to. And well, what qualifies as a good program? It's high quality teachers, it's appropriate um, caseloads and assignments for what they're asked to do, it's um, people who are able to evaluate and assess what the children need in a, in a um, very thorough manner. So that means we do need school psychologists who can do these deep evaluations. We need special ed teachers who have time in their schedule to test, write the reports, communicate with parents. It's critical that we have partnerships with our parents. Research says over and over and over again that school home partnership is one of the most important variables for student success. So we have to build time into people's schedule to talk with families. Um, families are, you know, you have well-educated families in your community here. Um, they want, they are invested in their children's education. They want to be doing the right thing. What can I be doing at home? So we have, we have to build time into people's schedule to enable that relationship build. So those, those are some of the um, containment strategies, I guess you would say. And, and Reading has a nice array of programs. Um, you know, we, we support a lot of the children right in the district. Um, those that go out really need that continuum of service. When the team recommends that, they don't come to that decision lightly. Um, and that's why we have programs out of district, because there are children for whom that is exactly what they do need. And then, you know, there's, a, there's always going to be in every district a number of um, disagreements around what the best program is for their child. And we're obligated as a school district to provide something that's called free and appropriate public education. It's free because the parents don't pay. It's the district. We have to pay for this. That isn't the way it was in the 60s or early 70s. That wasn't the way it happened. Um, it has to be appropriate. Well, what's appropriate? The child has to make meaningful educational progress every year towards not only their individual goals, but the curriculum standards that we're required to provide all our children. You know, it's public because it's publicly provided, and it's education because they are moving toward for independence for children. So that's what we're required to provide, and our programs offer that and then some. There are times where parents decide, you know what, that's okay, but I want the best. And the best for me, in my opinion, is school X, school Y. And you know, within the whole system of rights, they have the right to, to place their child there. 
And if they follow a certain protocol, they can come back to the district and say, you know what, I think you should pay for it. I think this is the better program. So we, we have those situations that we work through, and every district does. You know, in Massachusetts, there were 11,900 rejected IEPs last year. Okay, there is no state that comes close to that. No. So, and how many go to the trial stage? 26. So what happens to all those in between, right? You work it out, basically, one way or another. So we need to have staff who can work things out. Um, you know, the team chair people you have hired here, they're outstanding. You know, they do a really good job in working through these issues with families um, and doing the best thing for kids. The conversations I have with them is, what do you think we need to do for the child? You know, what's the best thing? And, and they are clear about what that is and it's backed up by data. So those are the kinds of strategies you have to put in place to be able to mitigate and prevent um, uncontrollable costs. It doesn't feel like it's uncontrollable. It doesn't feel like it's controlled, I get that. You know, when we have those, these disparities, disparities between our general ed cost center and our special ed, and it, the special ed takes a bigger piece of the pie. And the pie's only so big. You know, we want a 20 inch pizza pie, we only have a 16 we got to make it work. So th those are the problems that, that we really face in all municipalities, the departments, whether it's the schools or your other, you know, public service. You know, they need their, their funding too. So it, it's not an easy job that you have trying to balance all those needs. Um, but in terms of the themes that kind of come through, both from the school committee questions, the questions of the public, your questions, those, that's probably my, my best overview of the answers without getting into too deep of the weeds, and I, I hope I'm helping to clarify and not confusing the matter further. So certainly I welcome any follow-up questions. But thank you, Paul. That's a, a couple of good. So this, these are, um, this is an unfunded state mandate, is that right, that essentially is driving the requirement? The, the, the FAPE? For the FAPE requirement? So the FAPE is a, it's a federal requirement? And um, it's a federal standard, and it the federal government, when they made this a law back in 1975, Massachusetts was 74, feds were 75, so Massachusetts was the leader in the nation, as we often are in education. And um, when it was signed into law, they knew, the federal government knew they would not be able to meet their obligation. You know, their obligation was to fund up to 40% of the cost of special education to the states. With that caveat that comes after many of our unfunded mandates, you know, provided there is legislative funding. And the closest they've ever come is 17%. <laughs> so, and you know, there's competing needs, whether we're talking about the federal government or the town of Reading. So that, that, all, that plays out in every arena when you're talking about funding and resources and, and public dollars. So um, the federal government sends their money through what we call the IDEA grant, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It's an entitlement grant. It goes to the state of Massachusetts, and the state of Massachusetts then doles out those dollars to every town based on a formula that includes your special ed headcount from a few years back, because it can't be real time, as well as your socioeconomic factors and some other variables that don't seem to have anything to do with special ed, but they throw it into the formula. And that's how they decide how many dollars we get um, here in Reading or, or any town from those entitlement dollars. So, and that money is used, you know, Gail talks, says, talks about this in her offset um, descriptions where we use that to help fund some of the staff as programs have been <coughs> added. Um, the caveat with the federal dollars is you must comply with all the regs. They come out and monitor every six years to be sure you are. Reading is due next year. Next year, yeah. We'll have the, um, the states coming out to monitor for the feds. And, um, you know, we have to use it to supplement our programs, not supplant. So. Um. I think one of the challenges that, that <coughs> we certainly face in writing and, and everybody else is that there are certain things that feel out, out of control. Mm -hmm. For years, it was health care costs. And maybe those are a little bit better than they were, which 
which is great. And so that's a little bit calmer. And this one seems to be much less calm suddenly, mm -hmm. right? And, and potentially popping out to be a substantial difference. So, you know, the 300K that Bob has transferred is obviously going to be helpful, um, but it, it could be more, and you know, your answer said anticipated hundreds of thousands. Yeah. 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 So um, that's a challenge. The pie is the pie. Right. right. So we got to figure I that out. Completely understand that. Yeah. A um, couple of questions if I could Luke's just kind of drive through. So, um, stay with, with special education first. Um, with the in district programs, because there's a new director that's going to be coming, mm -hmm. is one of the areas that that person can focus on kind of looking at, at what we have and from an outside point of view, kind of evaluating how they work and thinking where things could change. One of the reasons I bring it up is because in the later years, the grades 11 through, uh, I guess, post grad, yeah. 34 out of the 62 out of district placements are there. Are there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like a big number, and it may be that the answer is they're just distinct, and that's the best way to handle it. Um, but it just begs the question of, gee, I wonder if there's something that could be done. Right, and part, and that question was asked um, by one of the school committee yeah, members, and it, it is a very good question. And um, so I'm going to answer it in two ways. One, will the, would a new director be looking at this? Absolutely. Yes. That is part of any new director's work, I'm, I'm going to speak for Chris and say that I imagine when she entered the district, she had as part of her entry plan trying to wrap her head around and analyze all of the programs. In general ed, that's what a new director would do. It's different than someone like myself who comes in for a year, and that's the plan um, as to how that individual would approach it. But that would be part of the entry plan, would be examining that. And just even the conversations I've had with people across the district this year, um, it, it, I have had the ability to offer sort of a fresh perspective or a fresh eye, because I, I haven't been here. So, um, and knowing you're only here for a year, um, it sometimes gives you more liberties than if you're here for the long term. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, so anyway, um, so the answer to that is yes, that's part of what a, a new director would do is take a look at that. But, but realistically, yeah. somebody coming in and, and taking a look, yeah. reasonably how long of an exercise is that? Is it in, in role for a year or so to really kind of, kind of see what there is? And then the next year, kind of evaluate that? Could that be done the, the first year? How long of an exercise is it to really wrap their head around? And, and it, it They're going to have to hit the ground running. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they'll start in July, but they'll hopefully be hired soon. Right. Hopefully so, March 28th. Usually, <laughs> usually an entry plan includes like sort of the pre-start time, um, and then over the summer we'll spend a lot of time as a central office team really trying to get the person up and running. We're looking at, um, we interviewed today, we're looking at very experienced folks. So uh, we're optimistic that somebody's going to come in with a great skill set, and uh, we, we feel confident that and I, I think it's also an ongoing assessment. I don't think it's sort of a, you start July 1st, right. by August 31st, you're like, these are the programs we're off and running. Sure. I think yep. this yep. is an ongoing, I know um, Chuck's brought it up in many of the, the school committee mm -hmm. meetings, is the continuous ongoing right. review of the programs. Are we, you know, cycling through, reviewing all of what we currently have, are those working are they doing what we anticipated them to do are there new ones so it's sort of i think an ongoing where it's not as cut and dry to say someone walks in the door three months later they're going to say we no longer need the eight programs you have we're going to institute six more and i think being sort of the lay person coming in to this the needs are constantly changing i sat through the interviews we had today for the Bed director, and it, it just hearing even different people in the room the the latest hot topic of what the latest item is that people want to address like that in and of itself can constantly change. So I think I would just caution that while that is a yeah. goal of the right. person coming in, it's a it's an ongoing assessment of what we have, what we need, what can change as we go through it. So I don't want to paint the picture that someone will walk in, they'll be the saving grace they'll come up with a whole new right. slate of programs because even if you come up with programs there, there's a lead time to say what is it what do we need right how do we staff it 
I, I don't want to get ahead of it, but where do we put it? <laughs> and, and, and any other. <laughs> like, where are we going to put these, right. these children in these programs? So I, I do caution that, yes, that is number one goal. It was one of the first questions we've asked each candidate as we go through, but it is, it's a process to do that, and you have to look at all. And I know we did get a question um, earlier today, and that's one of the cost-benefit analysis of what is it going to take to bring some of these programs in-house and if we look in the crystal ball 10 years into the future it so I I think that there are a lot of aspects of assessing programs so in I different just, ways that we would go about it as well it wouldn't yeah. be the same approach for every program mm -hmm. so I know the district hired an outside consultant to come into a program right. review yep. last year right. which was excellent gives a lot of information she's continuing to do some work with the staff um, we had we, the Walker report and that that was the person from Tufts right yep. we, yep. Right. Right. So, yeah so but I think it's ongoing I know Mark it was question 43 by the way that had that um, this, that was this answer, answer. answer. It's not exactly but it had pieces of what yep. of the school yeah, of the school committee yeah. questions. Yeah. So, right. I think it's important. You know, there's, there'll be an entry plan, and this is an important part of it. But this is. Um, yeah, it's looking at existing, how well is it meeting the needs of our known population, and as Gail referenced, it's looking ahead as to what is evolving that we may want to be considering, what our other districts seen that maybe we haven't seen yet here in Reading that we want to be on top of, um, and it's meeting with the people, it's doing the interviews, it's observing, it's getting to know the families, what they're looking for, all those things take time. So typically an individual would come in and probably have an entry plan that had my first three months, these are my tasks I want to do, my next three. And, and that's how I would approach it. I would break it into three yeah. month segments as to what are the tasks that I want to accomplish within the context of program review um, within that and be able to, they're, they're not going to be in a great position to inform FY21 budget in October of FY20. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then so the other piece to that, as you alluded to earlier, is yeah. that we are up for a coordinated program yeah. review, which is going to consume a lot of this person's time, yeah. which is mandated. We don't have a choice in that one. <laughs> so is, is, is a huge job, right, just yeah. coming in. Is, is this something that maybe you rely on outside consultative services to support, or is this something that the one person with internal support can be confident can take on? Or? You need budget for that. I, I, I'm just, you know, just, I mean, the back of everybody's mind here yep. on this discussion is space for programs, FTEs for programs. So, you know, that's... Um, we need to be cognizant that's what that yeah. right or be more of our present programs because I do think Correct. that's how we yeah. do so well as a district is yeah. having some amazing programs in house and right. can you so expand here that we're going to continue to really analyze them because what might have worked you know 10 years ago is not what's going to work today so I think we've been incredibly fortunate to get some consultative services from Mrs. Stewart here um, <laughs> and in a way with her expertise you know it's been it's always a challenge when you have a situation where you have an interim and you've been extremely fortunate. So in some sense, yeah. like this is this has been also a very good opportunity. We got some consultation for us. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Mark. I think I'll step down. Yeah, and there's, there's good consultants out there for lots of programs, and you know, continue to talk with them. And um, but you know, of course, we, we do live in a capitalist society, and you know, people expect to be paid for their time. So we do have time to do Go figure. Yeah. Um, question. So I um, I looked at some of the answers, and I attempted to go to the Desi website to look for some comparables. Yeah. That wasn't mm -hmm. the so the, what has happened is, which is more to the point of why special education is such a unique, where on the regular education side, teacher is a teacher, a program is a program, it's cost is not to oversimplify. <laughs> um, but DESE themselves stopped calculating yeah. a cost per pupil because Especially. they came right out and said there is no there's no similarity every district is so different that they actually in 2015 stopped providing oh. that information they used to have it on their website so they still calculate a per pupil cost based upon everything your end of year report which we 
we have attempted each year. That it's a very difficult number because, again, each district is different, and it's not just based upon our budget. Some of our budget is included in that number. Some of it is excluded. Some costs from the town are included in our end of year per pupil cost. So it's a little bit more complicated than just taking our total budget divide by students and come up with a number. And the numbers are actually, they always lag. So FY18's numbers are not yet available. There are certain districts that one of the last meetings I went to still hadn't provided their end of year report wow. to Jesse. They did get yelled at in the meeting. Um, so it's the, are the, they've accelerated the filing deadlines. We have to file by October 1st now, and they're actually not giving a lot of extensions. Um, but then it has to go through a whole audit process, and Desi reviews the numbers. So they actually won't start providing last year's numbers until probably later in March this year. So it does become a little bit more so I got complicated. That's the last one. Yep. We have a handle on where does Reading stand as compared mm -hmm. as of the FY15. Um, kind of, you know, around average, not, not yep. above. Yep. Well, maybe even a little bit below, actually. Yep. And again, what gets complicated, which is why Desi sort of stopped doing that, is it, it really depends upon what people classify in those numbers, and there isn't always a common thread to be able to do that. So, Mark, if I can put a little more, if you take a look at our percent of students that are on IEPs, we're right. just slightly below the state average. Right. If you look at the number of students that we have out of district, you look at other communities, it's for a community our size, it's fairly similar. So, yeah, you no, know, it's, it, it made sense. Yeah. And, um, I have to compliment you guys too. So I started looking, I had a little bit of time on my hands. So I looked at a couple of the town's budget, school budgets, like Linfield. Yep. Impossible. Three pages. It, it was, it was useless. I attempted um, to do that, but. It was really bad. So <laughs> I just didn't so fly. I went to Lexington just for, for giggles, just to see what happened. And, um, yeah, someone else has they had one category they called prepaid tuition. They talk yeah. about how they fund mm -hmm. special, special education. And they have a category they call prepaid tuition. Mm -hmm. I suspect so, we have it, don't carve it out, but. Correct. So there are so multiple you, avenues that people utilize for this. There is obviously, <laughs> we, you know, I'm always like, <laughs> kick me under the table. So we talked about the grant side of it. So there is the IDEA grant, which is one of our larger grants, which we do have a decent number of staff. Actually, majority of the grant is dedicated to staff. Um, we won't get into it a lot here. We've had a lot of in-depth conversations with school committee. A portion of that grant we do have to allocate to private schools. Don't that's new rules requirements that have come out. When um, we used to receive a what was called a program improvement grant that we used for consultative service, con have people come in, professional development. That grant, as far as we can tell, has dried up. We have not heard anything about it for this year. So that is money that used to be on the table. That's now gone. Um, we have what actually is still a grant is Circuit Breaker, which we apply for. We are, um, every year, we, we get an amount of money for that. We do every year, starting with last year, we are going forward again this year to apply to see if we qualify for extraordinary relief. So we do try to turn over every stone. So if your costs, if you go above certain thresholds based upon where your prior year number, you may be able to get additional funding in the current year. 25% um, over. It's, it's a very arduous process to go through. I, student I, by student, it's not a global thing. You have to and it's a every projection. Child. And But we are going to take every step we can to see if we do qualify to potentially receive extra money in Circuit Breaker. We are very fortunate that we have been able to get to a point where we have a year in reserve. So we are actually using last year's Circuit Breaker this year, so we can budget fact certain to our Circuit Breaker number. We do know many districts are moving towards that. There are those that do not. So the risk is you never know what the government's going to fund it. They could fund it at 65, up to 72%. Um, so there were many districts last year that got caught short because they assumed, because the government kept saying, we're going to fund it, we're going to fund it, and they, they well, didn't. Well, 2009, oh, 2000. they promised 72, yeah. and in January they cut it back to yeah, 30. They didn't give us the last quarter. Yeah. Last quarter. So, so they ran out of money. Yeah. Which, so we are very fortunate that yeah. where you, we have that year to adjust, which there have been years where they did the funding has been less, and we were like, okay, we now have a year to figure that out. Um, there, there is another concept which is allowable under Mass General Law where you can prepay 
next year's tuition using current year funds. It's one of the only instances in which up to three months, up to three months, which the municipal world allows you to prepay for a certain item. So <coughs> we have also tapped into that as well. So to the extent at the end of the year we go through all of our special ed funding we also go through we look through basically every cost center and to the extent we do have additional funds available if we need to transfer funds where we've looked at everything from everybody else and said we're in a good position um, or um, if we do qualify for extraordinary relief where we hadn't counted on it and we have to use that money in the current year that frees up funny money that we can then prepay what that basically does is that helps alleviate expenses in the future year because we budgeted a hundred percent but we may be able to pay it, it is a maximum of three months of the tuition for the student and it's not just a it's not a pile of money it is a student by student school by school program by program so if i think i'm going to school x for three months i end up going to school y repurpose it so it is also a very we well sure. thought out plan where we look at the student by student say who do we know the placement is solid um, we know the minimum we're going to have to pay because there are our, <laughs> the possibility rates will go up so we also have tapped into that each year we have been able to prepay and we do report that out to school committee at the end of each year how much we have prepaid for generally we have to we approve the transfers that, that happens every year but we think that's also financially responsible to do because it then does free up money in the next year. So that is, um, we don't, you can't necessarily budget for it because really it comes down to at the end of the year, what do you have available and what, what do you do? Thank you, Bob. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was looking at the opinions that are used to decide how to uh, or do, I guess, challenges to the, to the placements. I know we use legal counsel a lot. What's best practice? How is that done? Do other places do it the same way? Do we have multiple attorneys okay. that look at it? What, what's kind of the best practice? To right. to figure out so, how to yep. So, the, the first layer is at the director level to really make some assessment of um, what have we been doing for this child all along? Have we been providing the proper services? Because the director typically is not sitting in on the child by child decision making teams. That's what you're the team chair people for, the educators, the psychologists, the parents, of course, are part of that. So um, the director then is a step or two steps removed. So it would be part of their work to take a review. Um, look at the data, talk with individuals, try to make some assessment of, you know, is there something we can be doing differently to help improve what we're, improve the outcome, improve the parent satisfaction. Um, and that there are times where then the director would consult with an attorney um, where the director may say, you know what, I think this is the best plan that we put forward. We think we are, do we are meeting our faith obligation. Um, and then we would consult with the attorney to have that individual, and they have um, associate attorneys, paralegals that work with them, of course, um, who help to prepare the cases, the paper, review it all. <coughs> and then we, we talk with, with the attorney and we make a case assessment. Sometimes they'll come out and they'll interview staff, they'll meet with faculty. Um, to try and get a better handle on sort of how the program plays out with that unique child. Um, and then, you know, they'll make some recommendations. And that is pretty standard protocol. Um, there, I know that there are some districts who direct their teams that if the parent plans to bring an attorney, they want our attorney to be present. That is not how Reading is operating, which is, I think, a, frankly, a better way to operate. Your legal costs would go pretty high and your lawyers aren't part of your team. They're not educators. You really want your educators making the decision, not the lawyers. So, um, about what the child needs at the table. So, um, I think Reading uses the attorneys wisely. You know, I think the firm that that you contract with is a high quality firm. Um, they have a lot of a lot of support attorneys as well as the, you know, main partners 
that's pretty much who, who we interact with. We also use the to advise on student support matters across the district. You know, it can sometimes around special ed because it all goes through that call. So, but they might be called to help advise on a disciplinary matter, for example, of a high school student who was suspended, who's not a special ed student. But again, wanting to be sure we follow all the protocols because there, there's a lot of um, regulations that are in place to protect students and families, protect their rights. So we just want to be sure we're doing the right thing. Um, you know, so so they're called into for a variety of things. That yeah, are they not review our student handbooks um, every couple of years to make sure that legally we have everything in place for our student handbooks. Last week I used the attorney to look at a facilities access issue, uh, which is not special ed related. You know, so it, we, we use them for a variety of reasons. Is there any reason to have uh, multiple opinions that would come in in terms of when there's a challenge that is essentially going to go to court or is going to have to be settled a different way? I know, so we have legal counsel. I'm wondering, is that how other districts do it as well? Or do they yeah, usually they have one legal counsel, yeah. yeah. I, I will tell you, and it's interesting because our, our labor counsel also uh, can be, a, our, yeah, our labor council also can do special ed. And so sometimes when you have that tweener, um, we, we can also, in fact, sometimes we've used both at the same mm -hmm. time, depending on the issue, because uh, we need both sometimes. So we, we do have that, we actually are, we have that advantage with the two labor, the two councils that we have. I could yield the floor, we could continue. <laughs> How many more do you have? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, ten minutes. No, I just I got a couple of others. Um, actually, shifting a little bit out of the special ed, is that right? Yeah. Um, as it break. relates to, <coughs> sorry, I'm trying to kind of categorize. Um, so the space study that's going on. And. Mark, what question are you on? Sort of two. <laughs> two. And two of the FinCom. Yeah. Two of the FinCom, okay, because eight has a lot of space stuff in it, too. And eight has a lot of Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and actually uh, nine also. So um, actually, that's the way kind of the sort of bracket, though. Um, in terms of thinking about um, available space in town, is that part of the scope <coughs> of the daughters? Are we looking at what our needs are as well as resources we have? They are looking at, so it's twofold. They're looking at enrollment projections. So no cost, So that is um, more than just enrollment. It's actually we're, we're asking to do a census, which really doesn't just look at how many kids are currently coming in. It's looking at what's changing within the town itself is the population changing such that um, and all of this is a little scroller that I'm sort of making some of these up are the, is the older generation moving out which I know may not be the case based upon other but is the older generation moving out newer generation moving in what do you typically tend to see population wise when that happens do you you know what's the average number of children you would anticipate that they would have so three to five years in the future what could that potentially look at so they look at that for the area they look at that for the state they look at that across the country to say what what do we what have we been seeing as one population sort of ages out and another population ages in um sure it's a weird way to say that you also look at what is happening in the town itself from a development perspective so what types of developments are you seeing as one population moves out. Um, I can say this because I know I drive by a couple on my way in each day. Yeah. Are smaller houses being torn down and larger houses being put in? You may expect that if that is the case, you may see an increase in the number of families moving in because people are building larger houses. Look at some of the developments that are going in. What types of developments is the town doing and what is the expectation? So we're asking them to sort of look at a lot of that. I will caution that it's sort of a magic people. They're looking. They're doing a lot of statistical analysis, but nobody can actually predict what's going to happen because we want to be able to get a good sense of what do we think the population will look like. Because what you don't want to do, and I think I've said this in every com meeting we've had with this, you don't want to build the wrong school at the wrong size in the wrong location. Uh -huh. So you want to attempt to do have the best information you can because you never want to be 
that person on the front page that that's what they did. Um, so that's that's part of it. We have been asked whether or not they are going to predict what our special needs enrollment is going to be. That is not something that a census or an enrollment study can do. You can look statistically to say, on average, if you have X, you would anticipate Y percent. But you, you that is a much harder population to say, we think there are going to be X amount of two these types of services, um, <coughs> statistical analysis. The other part of what they're doing, this is where I'll get hit from behind, is the space part, which is looking at our existing schools, the space, how we'll be utilizing it. They also, we are asking them to look at our programmatic needs. That is where we can't predict necessarily how many students will need services, but we can look at the existing space and the types of programs we have, um, what we're currently doing, are we utilizing the space in the best way. So they will be looking at our existing structure and space as part of that. Inside the schools, how about beyond the schools? And the part well, of the I, but, two was okay, I, just, I just want to make sure, like, this, this, is, this is like beyond budget. I mean, I know this is really important, but this is very early. I just want to caution, this is, there's nothing in our budget uh, about this, right, that the $200,000 was is voted. And I think that um, it's very early. There hasn't been a lot of dialogue, you know, with the, the, the update that Gail provided in this packet is the last update that was given to the committee. So I don't really want to get out in front. Um, Right, and it, and it is elementary. It is elementary. Um, I don't know, Dr. Darty. I there'll be. I would assume through this, there's going to be opportunities for Dr. Darty and, and Chris Kelly, you know, to be able to, you know, provide input and maybe with the new director, if not Sharon. What might they, we need to give them the information about programmatic needs? So I'm not sure. There's a lot of process that has to happen, right? Um, but this is an elementary space need study. I don't. I, they're not. I don't know that they're going to look at other towns. If I was, in, in, was this going to? Uh, and I'm, I'm only asking this as a logistical question. Was capital something that we were going to discuss on the 13th? Yeah. So not, not yeah. this evening. All capital. So capital is. Not to speak for Bob, but this what? capital is sort of one pool of capital but, uh, Yeah, that's, what I, was, that's what I was trying to say. So our next <laughs> update will be yeah. the 13th. Okay. Yeah. So you guys will so be there for that meeting, too. Oh, we yeah. will be, but I will <laughs> caution and say the update you have in this will be the update we will provide. Yeah. The next scheduled update is slated for March 28th to the members of school committee, which we will invite everybody to Right. attend that as well we don't anticipate in the next week or two having another significant we are kicking off all of the projects now which is what it states we've just heard, um, the house doctor to do all of this so we are very early on in the phases so at this stage we are <coughs> we don't anticipate having another significant update until the end of March in, in question two, the answer to two kind of inviting more focus to special ed than general. But in the overview that, that you folks presented, there's a discussion of community concern about space needs, which in turn has led to the, the project elementary school space question. And so, what I was hoping is that you folks would say that as we did with the Early Childhood Center, we'll look at every resource in town to see what's possible, what could make sense um, I, as part of that analysis. And I think what we're saying is we're at the very early stages of it. We've just engaged the consultants, so I don't want to misspeak or get out ahead of what they are going to come back with. So I think we're saying that as soon as we have more information, we've been working very closely right. with the chair to s we have an update scheduled for March. We've already looked forward to say when would, after March, do we come back in May? Do we come back in June? So we are already thinking ahead throughout the remainder of the current fiscal year to give. What we want to make sure is that we're giving meaningful updates to folks with additional information that we have. Okay. Ms. Mark, is there, is there a question there, though, about the scope of the consultant's work, right? Yes. Which feels yeah. relevant. Yeah. Um, it's, it's which, which is, does the scope include them thinking about space that's outside, maybe outside of the school portfolio? 
right? And how that how that would play into our overall I think that needs. that's a difficult one because what we're asking them to do is look at our space needs overall. So yeah. they may say you it appears you I'm going to make this up. It appears you were short 10 classrooms in the next 10 years. Now, what we do with that information, whether it is we are going to look to expand upon, tear down, rebuild an existing school, whether we are going to look to do other avenues, I think they're going to come forth with a study that gives us here, here's where we are, here are some options Thanks, for you. Yeah. What those options are going to be, I, I cannot answer what that would be again whether or not they are going to know that, again, I'm making this, and maybe make that, whether or not they know there is a storefront available that may or may not even be a legitimate space to utilize for a school. <laughs> so yeah, I yeah. think what we're asking them. Requirements anyway. Right, yeah. right. And, and going, right. right. Yeah. We can't yeah. say what potentially we yeah. could utilize right. what's available until we need, if or they you say need. you need one classroom over the next 10 years, well, that's a different, Right. Problem to solve, then you are short X amount over the next Y year. So I, th I don't want to put the cart before the horse and say, yes, they're going to say, here's a perfect place for you to be because we don't know we need a place, if that makes sense. So I think we need to let the process unfold, let us work through with the consultants and look at all of our existing space, look at what, we, what the projections say the numbers are going to be, and then go from there. And I just key to look at the programs. I, I because if you look at our enrollment, really hasn't been shifted. Right. But, but if you look at uh, the, pro years, the programmatic needs have changed significantly. That's what's been driving our right. That's space. right. And clearly, that like I don't even I, I don't want to waste too much money of them looking at this hasn't this hasn't. I'm sorry, for 20 years it really hasn't changed. Can we focus on? Yeah. Well, I think I think the important we have not had an enrollment study done since 2001, mm -hmm. and with the increased developments that are going on in town yeah. and the turnover of homes mm -hmm. that Gail mentioned, it, it is time to do another. Yeah, right. I think but that's a step one. Yes, yeah. well, it's the programs and student need, and I think that that's yeah, why I included included the right. right. I mean, the right. programs to support student need, the mm -hmm. different, the interest in, in the programs like full day K. You know, I mean, these these are things that have shifted. So I, I don't. I I think we're going to This is a discussion we want to be careful of getting out in front of and, and you know. Seeing using hypotheticals that somehow get somewhere that, I, that is going to be troublesome for us tomorrow is, doesn't make me feel happy. So I, we want to answer the questions, but we want to be really cautious because it's not, um, you know, we, we, there'll be an update in March and all of the, the select board and fin, fin, uh, fence committee will be invited to that uh, school committee update for sure. One more question and I'll stop. Um, I think I remember this. I want to make a little chips. Yeah, I think that he used all of you. So long. Um, turf to timing, but more importantly, I believe there is. Are you going money. I am. I yeah, am, this is a capital question I'm again. I will. If you both should let me finish. <laughs> can, can I start by saying the information we have to, on turf two is exactly what's in the memo that was no, provided? No, you won't help the answer. Okay. okay. <laughs> I was trying so to. Let help. me ask the question, and you can follow through and answer this, please. Okay. So the question is: I think I remember you saying that there is a notion that turf two could be offline in fiscal 20 Correct. and there is an allocation of some sort to try to figure out some correct. operating yep. activities. That is correct. So sure I had that right. Yes, there is. So we have increased, we have put additional funding within the athletics budget to cover what could be busing students to another location. We are working very closely. We be, not me, Tom Zayas, um, to work with other districts to say, can we, basically, we may not have home games, can we utilize your fields? This happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, towns do this. We've, we've helped out other towns that their fields have come offline. We've let them use ours. So we have allocated a certain amount that could cover busing, or it could cover temporary lights to be brought over to Parker to light the field to allow us to have events. So we have, and again, that was a best 
estimate. estimate we had at Thanks. that time. And it's it's for the fall, Mark. It would be the fall right. season. I mean, the hope is is that we would have it available for the fall and the spring. Oh, yep. yep, yep. I just wanted to, I, yep. that's what I thought I heard. And I just wanted to yes. make sure. Yes. Actually, page 43 in the budget. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we could study in our budget book. <laughs> I made a lane break. As much as I did a lot of reading, I didn't read There's, it. there's, there's a lot. There's so a lot. We, yes, we, we might ask a question that's attempt articulated to cover tomorrow. More than, any, more than right. any other district. Which is also why we <coughs> decreased the offset awesome. coming out of use of school property because to the extent Turf 2 comes offline, we move to Parker, we bump paying people off of Parker to satisfy our needs. So it is a domino effect. So we did attempt to look at all aspects of Turf 2 coming offline. Mr. Chairman, I yield the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Other members of the committee. I saw in one of the uh, answers to the questions that uh, uh, data is not yet available with res from from Desi about how we rank in terms of per people spending compared to um, other communities across the state. I would it made me wonder for this year you're talking about for this year yes for, for last, last year, year. Well, it was not available for right. last year. Mm -hmm. I was wondering. Um, uh, if we know how we actually compare within our district uh, among the different schools in terms of per pupils expenditures, we, either with or without special education, as I understand those costs are very variable and we, student need dependent. We do not calculate that. Um, there, there are many reasons. We do give each building elementary gets a per pupil allocation each year for their budget. So we give them X amount of dollars per student that they can spend for their discretionary spending. Middle school gets the same allocation between the two middle schools, and then the is this like the high the school materials? Yes, yeah. yes. yes. So yes. they have that. Where it does get difficult is if building, and this is where the special ed piece. Different buildings have different programs. Some buildings have programs. Some buildings do not. So the staffing models are different. What also can happen is depending upon the seniority of the teachers in a building, that can also have a dramatic. Yeah. So you end up explaining, well, gee, you know, Wooden mm -hmm. has higher per pupil than Birch Meadow, which may, again, may not numbers. But it could mm -hmm. be that Wooden may have more senior staff in it and would end up, well, that's a bad comparison because Birch Meadow has the programs. But it could be that one may have more full day kindergarten versus another so it gets very difficult to try to level the playing field depending upon the seniority of the staff the programs that are there and also a lot of the special education costs are district level not at the school level as well so we do not currently cal because, try to because calculate. Of, because of the out of district. Yes. Yep. Probably wouldn't be a very responsible thing to do either. I mean, you would want. Uh, you don't want to pit schools. I don't, I don't so, ever remember doing it. Maybe I'll have to get a district. Does it. But the yeah. no, there is we, you know we, is you know what we have done, and, and, and the facilities which department does this every year, is we look at utility costs oh, by building. by okay. building, which okay. is helpful, obviously. Yeah. Right, um, energy costs. Energy costs. But that yeah. That's always helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the building budgets are, in case you wanted to refer to them, those are on page 32 if you wanted to. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's Elaine's role. That's Elaine's role. Do you have a photographic no. No. <laughs> There was a chart with irrigation yes. costs by school on it. I remember seeing it. Yeah. 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 To actually do so, right, Joe. Those <laughs> yeah. No, I just I'm just saying in case yeah. you want to refer back. I mean, yeah. we got any questions? Thank you. A hundred plus questions numbered, and the and we did ask Gail after uh, at John after the budget meetings. We asked them to go back into the presentations, right, yes. and put page numbers next to. The which chart. yeah, which we and that's on the so website. So if you we look online at our presentations, it will and you look at you're looking at the tables and the presentations. It now also refers to the But we do know there is an initiative coming out of Desi where Desi, yeah. based upon the end of year report, will be attempting to calculate a cost per pupil per school. And again, that does get a little bit more complicated because they for end of year reporting you pull in grants you pull in revolving accounts you pull in um, donations so there there are a lot of factors that go into 
what they do and do not and count, so it can be. How would, how would they account for special education? They don't. They don't. They're not going they to. That's they don't account not. for No, it'd be facilities. more like instructional materials account. or like. They look at true okay. core, you know, science materials. Okay. And one thing that Gail has done in the last couple of years is she's worked really closely, especially with the elementary principals and the middle school principals, mm -hmm. since they have two schools and then five, to make sure that we're using the same line items. So that, like, I, and I know as a, as a building principal for many years, that gets a little tricky because what I might call a literacy material might be an instructional material for someone else. There's a lot of line items. And, and you can see that reflected in some of the graphs that some years we had like a higher elevation and then it kind of went down, but then it was somewhere else. She's really, she's still working on tweaking that. Um, that it takes a few years to kind of tease out like what columns do things go in. And, and it's more not, it's more about consistency that, you know, after Apples are apples, yeah. are apples in different schools. Right. Um, they're not oranges. So, the, by the DESI codes that they yeah. use in their descriptor, the state codes, do so. not necessarily align with your district right. budget right. line items. So that's where there's yeah. some um, judgment that comes into play. The not into play, but that Gail has to apply as she's filling out those end of the year reports. So would you predict since the the hope is they will be looking at apples compared to apples that it will look pretty compar comparable to, for people. It, I, w I would not necessarily get, I'm talking about you define comparable. Yeah, I'm talking about actual items yeah. like I, I would call I a would, phonics book, for yeah. instance. Like no where does that go? Would be you, yeah. your, 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 your salaries are always your biggest driver. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And if you, as Gail said earlier, if you've got a veteran staff in one building, that per pupil is going to be higher. That will that will skew will it. That will skew the. Looking at that, they're they're not look. They're calculating they're it. Calculate. They're not looking at it. It's it, it will be a calculation. Be they just put the numbers out there. And you, right. Yeah. yeah it's part <laughs> of their report. They're, they're not just looking at materials. They are looking at. They will not looking at, but they will be reporting. Yeah. Based upon okay. how the district completes its end of year report. Okay. Yes. They're not going to account for that structural difference between schools. Like then, right? That's not. It'll be interesting times. <laughs> be People can use to support any agenda they can. Yes, like, exactly. Right? exactly. Okay. Yes. Exactly. We can't control <laughs> that piece. Yeah. We can't even control like the staffing costs as far as that, because like mm -hmm. if you have an older staff, you can't be like, hey, you know, let's we get some new you. cheaper people. You know, <laughs> right. Um, right. I think yeah, it's it's more from our perspective, it's more about consistency across the district as far as you know, if we're buying math materials, that we're really calling them math materials. Like something silly that came up years ago when when we were doing some of this work in another district I was in, that teachers often buy office materials, right? Paper clips. I mean, they need them as their teaching tools. But, like, they were being listed as administrative office supplies. So, like, some schools had, like, thousands of dollars, and people were like, wait a minute, how many paper clips does one school need? And the bottom line is they had actually gone out into instructional materials. So I think that it's a little trickier than you think. Gail has been really working hard with the building principals to come up with sort of the Reading version of that, but it may look different from another version. So if you looked at another district, you might say, well, how come they have less paper clips than we do? It, it could be that ours just somewhere else. Um, and it, we can't worry about that. It's yeah. item with DESI as well. They are continuing to request more and more be allocated to the school. So if we ever do get to the point where I'm allocating facilities-related costs, that would that could throw a whole new yeah, wrench sure, into it because sure. a different, an older building may be more expensive than a right. newer building or irrigation at one building yeah. versus another. So there are so many factors that go into a per pupil right. that we, we look at it overall and make sure we're making the right decisions across the district and not necessarily look at each individual school to say what is that particular per pupil cost because there are so many factors that may not be in the best interest of the child to be looking at it at so that it's, level. Is it, not to put words in anyone's mouth, would it be fair to say that looking at per pupil expenditures between districts is not a good way to assess what kind of educational serve, to compare educational services among the schools, that it's, that's a, It's not going to tell the whole story. No, it's not going to, no. So no. data, data is available and it's out there, people can gather it, form, look at it, it and interpret it, but you need to be I able to triangulate data in order to make informed decisions. So towards what end would we be doing that? Right. What are we trying to accomplish? Now the data that you, if you put the financial piece aside, mm -hmm. 
Some of the data you can look at, for example, look at class sizes. Are your class sizes comparable right. among your five elementary schools? Right. That's a that's you know. Mm -hmm. Are your two middle schools offering the same types of programs? Right. Um, are their class sizes comparable? Mm -hmm. um, do they have similar you know uh, support staff, exploratory staff, you know, all of that? At your high school, you offering the the core courses that the the Department of Education wants you to offer? Do we have adequate graduation requirements? Those are the types of questions that are not financially related, right. although they are indirectly, but mm -hmm. I think those are the things we want to look at to make sure our schools have a, you know, are comparable. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Um, I'm always focused sort of on- I didn't this. know you were gonna ask a question, I was just looking oh. at you. Like, <laughs> 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 um, always focused on sort of the bigger picture sustainability and I know we you know got our contracts in place so what I was trying to do is understand do we have a sustainable business model because our the biggest part of our budget is salary so if we look at um, expected increases both you know cost of living increases and then you know step <coughs> and so on what would we expect for level service? And I know we've got a number in there for salaries, which was, to me, looked like a very reasonable number. It was something like, I don't know, 3.2, 3.2 or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was like, okay, I'm okay with that. But I didn't know if that baseline was tracking to actuals, so whether it was a deceiving baseline, or would that be a, a appropriate number going forward for salary increase. You're talking about the increase in the budget is 3.2. For salaries. For like salaries? A little oh, bit no, for one of those. Steps in length. No, are you right. talking about 3.2 million or 3.2%? Sorry. There was something like 3.2%. It, it hit me in that's such a way, I'm like, okay, that's reasonable, but I didn't, you know, I, I thought it was like this. The budget is 3.2% increase. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, there's, oh, five no, there's, oh. a, there's a salary. What page are oh, you <laughs> what page is that, Elaine? You might, you might have stumped Elaine. I got the staff and I'm looking for the numbers. And it was, it was regular day. Well, I think what can be a little bit tricky yeah. is, again, it's comparing a budget to yeah. a budget. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So That's exactly where. What page is that? Now yeah. you're on page so 17, 17, probably. Yeah. Yeah. So that is a number that is. It's a big number, but it's still. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens with that is, so the professional salaries line, that's comparing the adopted budget to the proposed budget. When we did the adopted budget, we were still in the process of settling the contracts. We had put money aside in the override, so that's exactly. sort that of, baseline not the word that baseline, baseline may, might be the case. may have changed. So what I'm trying to Slightly. understand is what we're And that also includes offsets in that number too. That's not just pure salaries. That's also salaries reduced by offsets where we did increase offsets next year as well. So it's mm -hmm. a slightly convoluted number. There's more in it than just a pure what am I paying somebody. There are multiple pieces of that because that would reflect a higher offset for kindergarten in that number as well. Yeah, because it did look like a better number than, than you expected. You would, yeah. So, so it's multiple. Again, in terms of sustainability going forward, what what number is reasonable that we could look at? So for, what first level service. service? Yeah. So what we have provided in the answer is based upon what we know the contracts have settled at. And again, we're in the first year of it. Next year is known. The year after that is known, and then we will be in contract negotiations okay. again. So we cannot predict out further Agreed. where again, the again. contracts yeah. will and we can't settle. we can't really go beyond that but we don't know like let's say going into next year's budget assuming we have a good baseline yeah. what we'd expect salary increase to be for level of service you have the cola plus so we have cola it would be cola plus, plus steps, steps. And would be the yeah. best yeah, so well, initial number, question, have we analyzed that? So the step number step. we would, it's a it's yeah. a person by person, so we know that next year the contract settled at two and a half. Two and a half, yeah. Percent steps on average are four percent if you are on steps, so anyone on steps would get steps plus COLA. We are about, and that's just for the teacher. 
RTA so side. So we about fifty percent. It's anywhere from forty-eight percent yeah, to fifty percent each year. It's about half and half. What's it's about half and half. So would you a weighted average? So a weighted average would be about four point two percent. Including COLA. Including COLA. If I looked at the entire teacher population, that base in and of itself, approximately by 4.2%. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's where sometimes it gets tricky because we it typically have 4% plus. Yeah. So that is where that would be. Again, that does change depending on the people in those positions. If people, I mean, it gets yeah. tricky because they're, they're the pop, you know, somebody who may leave on top step would get X percent, but you have somebody coming in at, you may replace them at a lower step, but we also have the opposites that happen. But for the teacher population, I would say about the 4.2. Um, the other bargaining units probably would be slightly less. Yeah. Um, their steps are, yeah. are lower. And then you have the non-represented group that, similar to what you've heard through our presentations as well as uh, I'm pretty sure when the town presented, that also is a very difficult group to attract and retain. So we also need to utilize a competitive rate in there, whether that, you know, is that's something we work with school committee each year to determine what that number is because the, on the school side there are no steps for non represented. So it, it is not just a cola equation it is a market right so we yes. so that is the other okay. side that we work with very closely with the school committee on how to build those assumptions but yeah I would say the for the teacher it's, it's the 4.2 to 4.5 would be a decent range to use and Paul if you look at if you looked at a scattergram of the team so we, we actually uh, e distributed pretty nicely across all of the steps in terms of the number of teachers mm -hmm. and the fact that it, it's about a 50 50 is is good too because it's a balance you don't want to be too heavy in one because at some point you're going to pay for that at the other end right. so we do have a nice balance i mean we didn't plan it that way just, just, it's just that's because yeah. we've always hired we haven't always hired step one we've always hired the best candidate and i think that's helped us over the years from a budgetary standpoint mm -hmm. right and you said that younger and it's going to have a higher increase but your base starts out lower right so. right and there are other costs associated with younger more novice teachers and you know, mentoring and supporting and training and you know other costs that aren't going to show up Correct. on a salary line item mm -hmm. supervision time evaluation time all those things so that there, there is work that we did agree to in the contract to um, move forward with joint with a joint committee to look at the steps and steps and columns. So that's work that we should begin soon, I think, with them. But um, right, so you know, half the teachers get a, a cola and the step. Thank you. I have what I think is a new question, <laughs> uh, but I will caveat that at least part of the answer is in is it is probably a number one. But I want to think more broadly. Number one of the FinCom questions, but I want to think more broadly than that. So, um, in one of the January meetings, um, Nick made a point that um, didn't. I don't think he was looking for discussion. He just sort of made a point and kind of left it there. Um, and it, it took me a few weeks to sort of internalize it, but it's resonating with me, which is. Um, we live in a world where we're constantly budget constrained and it might you know force us into making decisions that uh, are the right ones in the near term to fit within a budget to fit you know to fit within the, the dollars we have in front of us um, but it might leave us squeezing out things that over a medium to long term would have you know what you call a positive ROI for for lack of a better term um, so my question is um, from a process perspective how do you guys think about um, evaluating things you'd make an investment in today that you know are going to are going to squeeze out other things that are maybe near Year term needs in the budget, you know, um, because they have a longer term ROI versus favoring the, the longer term pieces. Like, how, how do you think about balancing that? Um, so that's the first part from a process perspective. And then the second part is, um, are there things that you would point to that don't appear in this budget that fit into that bucket where you'd say, you know, if this was a private enterprise where you could go to a board of directors and ask for an investment, mm -hmm. you know, we can make a really good business case for thing X, right? That's a loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. I think you could. There are there are there are things that 
um, have come up. Um, if you look back to October 2016, um, you know there were things that we t we had talked about. Um, then we proceeded, you know, to fail an override and then have a, a past override, and some of those things finally got through in the final version of the override. Um, I want to let Dr. Darby. Um, start that yeah. and put that start that answer yeah. and then we'll keep going. Well, he got time because I, I sent him an email. Prep yes. yes. Uh, yeah. we, did. We, we, we actually, yeah. we actually, yeah. we, 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 did. Yeah, we put did. an answer together. Uh, um, I'll preface it and then I'll, I'll actually let Sharon do the majority of the talking on because she put together a great answer. But, um, and I think we gave a similar answer the night that question was asked. So when we went through the budget process this year, and we did spend a lot of time talking about special ed in our, in our budget discussions yeah. with uh, principals, but it was also the general ed piece too. So we met, I mean, we had several layers of meetings. Gail met individually with principals. Gail and I met individually with principals. We included Sharon, we included Chris. And then we met, once we compiled all of the needs, we then met as an administrative council, a district leadership team. And so we looked at, you know, all of the different needs of the district and through best practices, research, evidence-based, um, what, what works best for kids, what are our priorities of the school district, what does our district improvement plan say. Um, you know, all of those things help fuel what we, and obviously we have this restriction, which is the financial piece. What is it that we feel is the best budget we can put together with the resources we have? So that's in a nutshell, you know, how we do it. So we look at everything, the special ed piece obviously because we, we had a lot of needs in special ed, um, we received the most focus, but we were also, we had principals come forward with um, some, you know, regular ed positions too that we just could not fund in the budget this year. But I'm going to let Sharon Well, I mean, I think you've, you really talked about the overview, John, quite a bit, and I think, you know, a lot of, you know, we did try to put together some you know, responses to the questions that you forwarded to, to John and Gill. And, um, you know, we do look at these global priority areas, and then we have to um, you start there, and then you delve in deeper and deeper at the student level, and what do we need? So if you're, yeah. if you're looking at this more from a business model and um, R&D and, and yeah. capital investment, then that isn't typically how school districts and municipalities can operate. So um, there are always going to be competing needs. Yeah. So how do we decide what's in and what's out? So, right. So it's the essence of your. It, it is. So what I'm what I'm trying to get at from a from a you know it, from a sort of a partnership angle, right? Um, you and your roles have to have to fit a budget, right? We in our roles have to think about the long term sustainability mm -hmm. of the town's budget, right? The, you know, the budget matters. It's important. It's obviously sure. why we're here tonight. But um, we also have to think about the long term sustainability of the budget. And so, um, so. You know, uh, um, appreciate everything said. It all makes sense, and I and I do remember that uh, there was more discussion than I remember in January when we talked about it. But um, uh, you, you know, with, um, on a spectrum of as we solve for like the things we need next year, you probably have to orient towards we solve for the things we need next year if you have to make trade offs. For the, for the most part, I mean, that's not I'm sure it's not perfect. But um, so, wh where in the process do those other things fall out and? What are some of those things? So I, so I, I think I'd, I'd probably defer yeah, to Chris because a so lot's going to fall. As part of that, we do start each year. Everyone has sort of their, if you will, kind of wish list. Like we meet with folks. I go not only from Chris and I spend a lot of time going through in a perfect world how much mm -hmm. curriculum material, how much professional development. Um, how much extra time would we like to have certain of our positions that may not be year-round here in a perfect world? Would we like to have additional staffing in X, Y, and Z? So we sort of, so I, actually my background, I come from the corporate world. I spent the bulk of my career there. So that concept is very near and dear to my heart. And a lot of the people I talk with that meet with it just like, well, can't you just go and ask for more money? And I'm like, ah, oh, it doesn't really work. <laughs> no. Um, so I meet with Chris, I meet with um, 
our IT manager as well and we go through okay where are we in a perfect world if you had unlimited funds what applications and systems would you get we go through a similar process on the custodial side we had a lot of in-depth discussions in a perfect world if you could hire as many custodians as you want to fill every need where would we be we do the same with with special ed so we we constantly do that and then when we compile it all and we look at where are we versus how much funding do we have we have the really long hard discussions of exactly that okay what is this going to get us if we looked out into the future versus other there are certain things that are mandated that regardless we have to to spend for but you know Chris can walk through her methodology when we've had to look at the technology spend and, and how we're doing it the curriculum the, the professional development that we do we do get creative but there is a lot of thought that goes into position a compared to I don't want to say versus because it is it is a comparison and we do look at the end of the day what do we expect the outcome to be so it, um, from like a global perspective um, we, we always have to start with the have to's first right sure. so we have to provide this yep. we have to provide that um, and then there's lot, lots of what we'd like to provide and and I feel blessed that in writing we try to offer as much of that as we can um, and we do a lot of it very creatively <laughs> design on a dime you know sure. is our is our mantra um, we do a lot of collaborating with other districts we share costs um, you know we're looking at PD really intensively and like how much bang can we get from our buck we're trying to bring a lot of PD in house including graduate level courses here we do a ton of reimbursement which is great um, for graduate level courses for our staff it's part of their contract but it's it, it would be really great to have more in-house things where we have adjuncts working right here in the district so we have teamed up with a partnership with Gordon College and we're gonna provide lots we're gonna start uh, we already started this year with two courses so far and this summer we'll have the Writing Institute summer but as far as the curriculum piece I'm really working at like a three to five year plan and and the way I just described this at the school committee meeting a few weeks ago is like thinking like a clock right and at noon that's where you do like major curriculum changes but then every you know we're always curriculum changing right because math five years ago looks different than math now and social studies voila the state's like all brand new now so you know everything has to be somewhere in the clock we can't have everything be at noon right. and we can't have everything reside at six um, and so what we need to do is have a strategic plan of like where do these things fit and then when does your turn around the clock get there and then when are the pressure points so some of the pressure points are when the state says voila you have to do something new or we look at our data and we say yikes what we're doing for whatever reason isn't really what we thought it, it maybe worked 10 years ago I think you used that point Paula earlier but maybe it isn't working now or we're hearing from our staff that you know we really need something to change this up so we're really looking at like sort of putting things around the clock in, the, in a three to five year fashion so that our budget needs will follow that and I don't think that has been done systemically um, but it is hard to plan for that because yeah. then there's the unexpected cost right so so like social studies wasn't really a, a midnight thing for me it, it, it now is so um, yeah. you know it's midnight at the oasis like I'm definitely all in in social studies right now <laughs> the state has really required that and it's exciting and we're doing a lot of work around that but even around that like there was a state grant we were first in line to apply you know it was one more thing to apply for and we got seventy five hundred dollars which we didn't expect seventy so. five hundred yeah. dollars we're in the corporate world seventy five hundred dollars <laughs> hey I, that I was thought, a lot I, I, I thought we wouldn't get that so I just, I, if I can I just want to offer I've been 14 years on the committee yeah. and so I was through I was on the committee right after or at the override in yeah. level three yeah um, and then I was on the committee till 2010 and then back since 2014 and I was just meeting with Dr. Coram here before the meeting to give him a couple policies and I said this is the one that I read the most and it gives me the most heartache I want to read it it's very short because it's under our fiscal management goals because of resource limitations, there's sometimes a temptation to operate so that fiscal concerns overshadow the educational program. 
Recognizing this, it is essential that the school system take specific action to make sure education remains central and that fiscal matters are ancillary and contribute to the education program. This concept will be incorporated into the committee operations in all aspects of the school system management. That is singularly for me the most difficult thing to do. And I, I don't know how many budgets John had. I know many, many more. The, the preponderance of the budgets I ever voted on were ones that were angst and, and many that were not recommended. So, I, and I, one other quick example, our um, K, um, ELA and STEM coordinators, my sons were in fifth grade or fourth grade when we were trying to do that. Paula will remember, they were, her kids were at Killing too. We had been trying since my sons were in fifth grade. They're 25. And, you know, I, and I hope that we will be able to work with our community to continue to provide the additional funding that this, if you want, this strong school system in this town is going to require additional funding. And everything that we've talked about tonight really sort of says that. Yeah. So I appreciate your question. I mean, I could I could pipe off the things that I would like to see in our district. Okay. And that's that's Barry, kind of what I'm asking, right? Because right. so, well, so, full, so, 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 full day K. I want to see full day K. Do we have the space? Do we have the money? You know what else? <laughs> I want to see Wednesday half It's a little smaller than full day. Okay. <laughs> so, I, so I can, you know, I, so, you know, one of the, I mean. <laughs> Wednesday half day. So. Smaller not. I mean, yeah, aside from the full day K, which, I mean, we're at 90% now. We might as well just go the other 10% and fund it for everybody. Um, <laughs> Is it is as Elaine said the you know the the Wednesday at the elementary school and making that a full day school. In order to do that though, you need to provide the planning time necessary Specialist. that 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 the teachers need now. Why it's why it's a half day so on Wednesday. That would probably take five or six FTEs of specialists to do that. Um, you know across the five elementary schools. The other thing that more and more is more elementary college. Yeah. Um, right now we have a school psychologist in every school at the elementary level, but they have a dual role. Um, they test and they provide counseling. Mm -hmm. And more and more we're seeing school districts go to a model where there's more elementary counseling support. Because if you can nip it in the bud, the, the social emotional concerns at that level, it it solves the problems down the road. So to me, that would definitely be an area that I know. Right. I use that example of the coordinators to, to because of the long term. Because clearly, right. that's something that right twenty years ago we knew, we knew was the right model. Right. But we had just never. We, yes. So you put off the things at a long term. We've actually been talking about the Wednesday half day. It's in writing in that. October it was in the it was in the first override. The yeah. first override as something <coughs> that you know we know it's it, it's hard for families to <coughs> figure out the care situation for that Wednesday half day and do the logistics. And but we need the FTEs to be able to provide the planning time. So you know, there's there's a, a bunch of things, but I think the most important thing is that the, that you know we've been talking about the special education. We're talking about social emotional. We're talking about earlier interventions across you know general ed. These are things that have changed dramatically since, you know, maybe our children were in school or definitely since we were in school. Different models and they are more FTE in terms of Dr. So virtual classroom at the high school. Right, which we don't have any, we're, we have no virtual high classroom in the high school any longer, which just seems insane given probably where we all are on our work, or in our workplaces. So, um, I don't know, is that what you are looking for? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I just, I think about, you know, take it back to 2010 when you were starting your second stint, right? Um, and I heard about the idea grants showing up and all this sort of stuff, right? So I would imagine, I wasn't, you know, what I didn't live in town in 2010, but I would imagine in 2010, there were some things that we took out of the budget that we look at now and say, you could probably make a pretty straight line to things that may be yeah. costing us more today. Well, some early intervention because programs. Some early intervention right. programs or other types of, you know, other types of sports, right? That we maybe had to, that had to go just because of budgetary constraints. Mm -hmm. And it's probably costing us more now today than we saved in 2010, mm -hmm. right? Um, and maybe that's happening on a recurring basis because those students come back every year, right? Um, they were kindergartners then, they're eighth graders now, they're the ninth graders next year, or they're maybe they're ninth graders now, do the math. Yeah. But um, so, uh, you know, that, that's, that's what I was trying to get at. Um, 
hundred percent appreciate all the things that you, you just highlighted here. Um, those are, I would differentiate those as being sort of incremental, incremental to what maybe we've offered in the past that we've had to like, that we've had to lose because of budgetary constraints, right? Which isn't to say that they're not the most valuable things you've invested in next, but um, that's kind of the angle I was thinking about it from. Could I ask Dr. Doherty to expand on each of the one example you mentioned was the uh, the, the counseling additional the, counseling yeah. is that is that due to is that something that a, a need that's been there for a while we just haven't been able to address it or have you seen a, an increased need recently uh, to 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 provide no more I counseling? think I think it's been a need that's been there okay. for a, for a while and, and our our staff do an amazing job and we've. You know, we've tried to put in over the last several years some tier one supports and curriculum uh, through our social emotional learning to be able to to do more with that. But I, it's clear that you know the the needs of the students are changing, and we we and because of the dual role of the school psychologist, because um, we have to have someone to do the the testing as well as we have someone to do the counseling support. I I think it's a need. Yeah. So it's under that social emotional it's a social, yeah. health umbrella. Yep. So there's lots of different types of roles that might fall under there. And um, I think to your point, Mr. Brandt, it's, you know, there's always going to be competing needs. And we need to be looking at research. We need to be understanding what's happening out there for our kids. We need to be predicting into the future and try to build the right support. It's kind of like Gail's analogy around the school building. You don't want the wrong building in the wrong neighborhood with the wrong number of classes. Same thing with our staffing and supports. And you know, and Chris's Chris's job is is significant in that unless we build proper general education supports and structures and curriculum, we are going to have problems. So that has to be really strong. So you do need to invest in the general education right. program. And professional supports. development is key. I mean, yeah. when you talk about like an immediate thing, return on your investment, yeah. Yeah. professional yeah. development yeah. is the best money spent. And our staff is awesome, and they love to learn. And we need to teach them. So we're teachers. Um, you, but it costs. If you look at, and you mentioned 2010, and every year the first thing on the chopping block has been professional development yeah. and parent. Right. And yeah. Those are the two things that go first. Right. That you spend every year trying to add those back so that you don't mm -hmm. get behind. Right. Yeah. It's exactly the methodology you just now you're talking about. Yeah. So I mean, if you if you look at that elementary counseling support, you know, line item or wish list item or whatever you want to call it, um, it's not a line item yet, I guess. Um, uh, is there? And I would I won't pin you down to any numbers, but is there a business case that says, you know, two FTEs we think you know would would result in um, some number of students that don't have to go out of district, some some you know some number of years down the line, or. Uh, some number of students whose you know the supports that they need are otherwise less intensive, right? I mean, can we, through research, through experience, you know, is there a case to be made there that those types of investments can have kind of a direct? And it feels callous to talk about students as cost centers, but that's <coughs> what we have to do here, I think, unfortunately. Um, but the, you know, the outcomes are obviously tied to the, tied to the cost in this case. You, so. you have to look at the student needs. Okay. You, you, you can't equate an FTE to. You have to look at the needs of the students and what what we have in place and what, what types of supports those counselors could provide. Um, as I said, the tier one piece would be huge and to continue to provide that type of social emotional learning curriculum to everyone. And we do it through the classroom, but if you had additional staffing doing that as well as providing counseling support, yeah, that would that would help. But I don't think you can equate a number of an FTE to Yeah, I, I wouldn't you gotta look at the you gotta look at the individual yeah. needs. Yeah, you, yeah. you need you need intervention points and, and yeah. what I would describe as wraparound services. So the schools we work with the children thirty hours a week, say. They're spending the rest of the time within the community, with their families, so that in order to really make a difference in social-emotional development, you need to have support across the continuum of where the children are. And you need to support families as well. So it's not just about the counselors working with the child in the school. It's about what are we doing to support families as well, you know, from a town perspective and community perspective. So things like youth mental health first aid, all the yeah. costs, yeah. like the, in that area, right? Sure. That the, the, those programs are parts of that wraparound and parenting university mm -hmm. that we do. 
I just want to I want to echo one thing that Chris said that that I, I think is a big emphasis, and that is the human capital piece and investing in the human capital piece. So, which really creates the time and training. So the professional development, which is the training, but to be able to take that training and create the materials and to be able to implement the materials and the curriculum materials and practice their new skills. That, that to me, is your biggest ROI. Um, you know, the PD piece is, is, is critical. The time piece is a lot tougher to, to figure out. Um, and the substitute line is the other one that we like to cut, right? So you need other people in the classroom for them to do that or, or for somebody to pair up. And that's another one of those line items that Chuck is one of the first ones would say, you know, we're, we're cutting. We've turned on. Feeling really up now, aren't we all feeling really <laughs> up? <laughs> we have an amazing school district. We're all invested in keeping it that way and keeping it moving forward. And so this is a hard discussion. <laughs> Any other questions from everybody on the committee? Mark twice, just to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> Mike choosed all his questions for the next three weeks. <laughs> but the work you guys all do. And we, uh, and we appreciate that we did see a lot of yeah. familiar yes. faces attending the January meeting, so we do, we did appreciate that we because appreciate I think it, yes. it yeah. helps the process mm -hmm. along. So hopefully, like you said, the answers we attempted to provide as much information and we will continue to update right. That's all nice feeling. Feeling. as we go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It, it is a nice feeling. Yes. <laughs> It's the it's the first one yeah. that I've had. I mean, it, it last year was the right, but it's the first one yeah. in, since I've been superintendent that we haven't had to do any cuts. Yeah. So I just want to thank all the staff, Dr. Darby, Chris Kelly, Bell, Sharon Stewart, who are here tonight and have been probably at work since like six thirty in the morning. Joel Huggins. Yeah. Um, sorry. Bye. And. Uh, yeah. Appreciate it. Bye tomorrow. Thanks. So. Yeah, I was just going to say, and you can go back now and make today. sure. I'm going to look at our committee members who are here tonight. I think I'm going to, I need to adjourn the committee. Any other questions for anybody in the room? Want anything? All right, I'll add my thanks to Dr. Doherty, Ms. Kelly, Ms. Stout, Ms. Stewart. Thank you very much. Thank thanks for having us. Um, yeah. at, at the end of the day, I, I agree wholeheartedly with Elaine. We do have a wonderful school system. Um, so thank you very much. Good stuff. And I appreciate you. Well. We agree, too. Come back to the forum. Do I have a motion from the Second from Dr. Sackett. All those in favor. Minutes to approve. Do we have pronouncements? Yeah. Um, they're in your so inbox. Really? No, we don't. Not with light snow. Yeah. 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 Y
Is there? I did. Oh, that's funny. Oh, so, so, <laughs> oh is that that funny picture? Yeah. Like, I'm just so like, we've got a, like, we've got a to request to postpone until next call. week. Yeah. Uh, postpone time certain time until time next week, <laughs> right? Yeah. Until we meet on the sixth. Is that what we're saying? Wait, yeah. You, 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 you have to have an actual yeah, motion to yeah. vote on that. <laughs> Can we just? Do you think so? Okay. We probably don't need it. It's on the agenda. I think we have to probably postpone. It's a proposal. Uh, it's a proposal, not a motion. Okay. We've got a motion it to postpone. Require a motion. Let's do it with the motion. We've got a motion to postpone until next week. Did you want to look at this? Second. Second. All in favor? Okay. Okay. We'll we'll take up the minutes next week. Any other business uh, comments from the committee? So one thing I can find capital. Um, so it will include the school capital. Yeah. All capital stuff. So then there are a couple items that are turf too. The lighting and the turf, it seems to be split between school and town. Uh, right, the uh, lighting uh, and stuff. It, it's not that it's split between school and town. It's that they've split the they've split the lighting for turf two out of the broader lighting project now. Mm -hmm. So, oh, right. So it's not in the school department. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So we, I, I'd like to be good to get a coordinated picture. I'm getting some questions about that. Yeah, there's also it says large technology projects. There's one under school, there's one under town. Mm -hmm. We probably can get a slightly better description. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that's separate from the security. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just sitting in the capital. It's small. $100,000 for large scale technology project schools, and then administrative services the same. $100,000 for large scale town technology projects. Oh, uh, that's a nice brown number. Okay. Yeah. All right, so next week, I think most of the town departments. It's town minus DPW next But DPW, that's the one. I yeah. couldn't remember. Was that DPW? And yeah. then uh, Enterprise, DPW, and Capital on the 13th. So. And are we, we think, we're thinking we're going to vote the warrant on the 13th as well? Yeah, so that's the other thing that Bob suggested that uh, something to consider in one of his emails because there was a, what I think was a good degree of attendance and participation in some of the earlier meetings. Yeah, I think we're originally scheduled to meet the 20th as well and then yeah. vote the 20th and maybe we can do that the 13th, okay. right? So uh, not need the meeting on the 20th. So um, we don't need to force it if it yeah, doesn't make sense, sense, but if sense. we can do it, we can do it. So. Sounds good. Great. Motion to adjourn. Second. Take that out of my mouth. <laughs> All in favor. <laughs> I think I did this and then your words came out. <laughs>